Amen. Yes, uh, you can clap. That's all right. <laughs> For the love of God, he came. Amen. And this was manifested, the love of God. Among us, that phrase has stood out to me in 1 John 4, 9, that God manifested his love, not just vaguely, abstractly, but among us, within the human race, and that God sent his only son into this world so that we might live through him. Thank you, uh, Weatheralds, for the beautiful song this morning. I preached uh, just last month at Mom's funeral that the greatest threat to humanity today is not disease, it's not nuclear, not holocaust, it's not environmental change, it's not social injustice. All of those may be threats to our world, but the greatest threat in humanity today and was in the beginning, is now and ever will be to the end of this age, is the real possibility that people will forget how to love. Today, the theme is of Advent is love. Now, when I say forget, I don't mean something as in something that just temporarily slips our mind. That happens all the time, right? How many things have you forgotten this week? Well, you don't even remember, right? You've forgotten them. They slip out of your mind. You forgot this. You forgot something on your schedule. You forgot something at home. You misplaced something. You, you set down your, your coffee cup this morning and then forgot where you put it. You walked into the kitchen and couldn't remember what you were in there for, and so you just went to the refrigerator and got something to eat, right? Uh, you, uh, and it just happens, right? It happens in our life. I don't mean forget like that. I mean forget in the sense that we redirect our lives quite intentionally and even somewhat nonchalantly. We redirect our lives. Let me give you an example. Just a couple of weeks ago, or actually I think it was... Uh, yeah, it was the week of Thanksgiving. We were either going or coming from Cincinnati, and uh, we, we took an exit to uh, fuel up in gas, and we took the exit, uh, and, and we're getting ready to pull into the gas station, and I saw a car pass me on, in my rearview mirror, and I saw that car turn to get onto the interstate, but there was one mistake. He turned onto the exit ramp. All right, so you know what happens with that, right? He turns to the exit ramp, and in mere moments, and I was looking in my rearview mirror, I pulled into the fuel station, and by the time I got in, I stood out, I, didn't, I wasn't doing anything, I was just watching, what's going to happen here? And he, he, quickly, he quickly realized his mistake, and it's true, the signage there and the way the roads come in together, the exit and the entrance are right next to each other, so it's a little bit tricky, and yet, uh, I don't know if it was the fact that the road was clearly curving to the west, and he he knew that he needed to curve to the east, or if it was the big red sign off in the distance that said wrong way, I don't know what it was, but something uh, before disaster happened uh, let him know that he was going the wrong way. And so I watched as he made about a 10-point turn uh, to try to get his car turned around the right direction. That's what I mean by forget. I mean just kind of ignore. Like, we know what love means. We've seen through God's Word. We know through the Christmas story that God has manifested His love among us. We, we know what it means to love. We look at the cross. We know that love means that we make a commitment to those who may not reciprocate our love, right? We, we, we show love even to our enemies, as Jesus taught us. That's what I mean when I say the greatest threat to humanity is that we would forget to love. I mean that we would become so careless that we would overlook all of the clear signs, that we would lose a sense of direction in our world. Are we going east? Are we going west? That we would become disoriented. Now, before we get to the scripture, the main scripture, this one on the screen, as well as Matthew chapter 1, I want us to, to do something, a little exercise. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the love chapter. The love chapter of the New Testament, Leviticus 19 is the love chapter of the Old Testament. But let's look at the love chapter of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13. But I want to suggest, uh, let, let, let me read it to you in a disoriented fashion, all right? I'm going to read it to you. Not in the way Paul says it, not in the way that the Holy Spirit inspired it, but I'm going to read it to you through the words or through the sort of conceptions or practices that, that actually happen in this world, all right? A disoriented way. 
So we know this, this uh, passage, I think, pretty well. Many of you memorized it. If you ever went to FCA, you memorized it. Uh, we make reference to it quite often. We know that how, how Paul begins, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not charity. We, we, we know those. But this is how I think people really, really try to live out love. It re, we would rewrite sentence one or verse one this way. Look at how well spoken and articulate I am, speaking like an angel while everyone else is just making noise. All right. Verse two. Didn't I tell you so? You should have listened to me. Trust me, I understand these things. I can tell you exactly how things are going to turn out. Have I told you about all of the problems that I've helped people solve? It's like I can move mountains for people. I'm telling you, you need to listen to me. Right? We all, we're living in a world where everyone wants to be listened to, right? And no one wants to listen. Have you all realized that? Verse 3. Yes, I have time for you to listen to me. What else do, you, do I have that you need? My expertise, my money, my talents? Listen, I'm willing to serve because I really think I bring a lot to the table. You're going to love that you asked me to help you. Now, just remember, I'm not the one who has something to gain here. Verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Well, now I need you to understand that I just don't have the patience for stupidity. I am a bit impatient, sometimes a little sarcastic, and just between you and me, I get a little irritated when others get more appreciation or affirmation than I do. I don't think people realize how much I have to offer. I mean, these are thoughts that go through <laughs> our minds, right? <laughs> Seem to characterize the world we live in. Verse 5, if people would just listen to me, they could avoid so many troubles. See, I told you so, but you wouldn't listen. How many times have you said that to someone? I don't know why you would ignore me. What? You, you listen to him? You listen to her? What does she know that I don't? Why would you trust him over me? Verse 6, I saw that coming. I don't know why anyone ever liked him anyway. I'm not happy he failed, but I definitely saw that coming. It serves him right. Now let me tell you the truth. He deserves what he has coming to him. Wait, you think I need to hear some hard truths? Are you attacking me? That's not true. You're not judging. Are you, you're, are you trying to judge me? Isn't that our response, right, to hard truths? Verse 7, we would rephrase something like this. I just don't have the patience for me. I'm not going to put up with it. I'm pretty sure they're doing it on purpose. Didn't you see that? How else could you understand it? They meant it for evil, no doubt about it. I hope they get what they have coming for them. I'm just done with them. Verse 8. Yeah, I choose my friends carefully. If you do it my way and see the way, see things the way I see them, we'll we'll get along real well. Otherwise, we can't be friends. Listen, I get it. I've been around the block a time or two. People don't change. Believe me, it's going to be the same. Right? Verse nine. We'd rephrase it this way. Listen. Let me just give you the big picture here. This may not make sense to me, but it does to you, but it does to me. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Verse 10, what do you mean when the perfect comes, the part will pass away? If people would just see, see things like I do, this would be a perfect world already, right? Verse 11, when I was a child, you mean when you were a child, am I the only adult in the room? Verse 12, I'm so sorry that you only see things through a glass dimly. You just don't see life as clearly as I do. Do you want me to tell you what you ought to see? What? You, you want to know me? I just told you all you need to know about me. Faith, hope, love. Yeah, the wor world really, really could use some of that. Right? That's kind of the way the world wants to live out love. This is a disoriented reading of 1 Corinthians. And yet, it's what we see in the world today. It's like uh, the helicopter pilot... Ara Sabayan, who took off from John Wayne Airport in Orange County, California on January 26th of this, of this year. He didn't intend to become disoriented on that 30-minute flight from Orange County to, to his destination. Yeah, that's exactly what happened as he flew through the fog on that early morning 
and all indications by his sight where he could see things it seemed as if at least he thought he was elevating up to 4,000 feet when in fact he was rapidly descending until he crashed into a hillside in Calabasas, uh, California killing all nine on board of course we know that crash because that's the crash in which Kobe Bryant and his daughter and part of their basketball team perished but investigations, which by the way are still ongoing, but preliminary investigations suggest that Sabayan was not paying attention, get this, he was not paying attention to his altitude meter. You would think that'd be flight 101, right? Pay attention to that altitude meter. Is, does it look like you're going down or does it look like you're going up? Point is, is that many times uh, the world becomes a bit of a fog. In fact, in many ways, 2020 has, has been like a dense fog. How, we, we've become somewhat disoriented. We don't know how to act, how to, how to decide, what to do. Do we do this? Do we do that? All year long, we've been second-guessing ourselves, right? <laughs> well, maybe I'm speaking for myself. We second-guess ourselves. Am I being too careful? Am I, not, am I being careful enough? Should I do this? Should I not do that? We, it's very easy to become disoriented. And it's very easy in the midst of that to become like, uh, like this pilot, Sabayan, to become disoriented, thinking you're going up when you're going down. 1 Corinthians 13 is to our relationships in life what that altitude meter should have been to that pilot. It's what you've got to pay attention to, especially in the fog, especially when things are not clear, especially when things are difficult. You've got to pay attention to that altitude meter. You've got to pay attention to that, to that standard of love given to us, especially so clearly right there in 1 Corinthians 13. But then that takes my attention then to Matthew chapter 1. And turn, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Because while we live in this world where it seems that, that love itself has, has become something somewhat of a fog, people, quite frankly, have become quite selfish in our world. We have a different story in the story of Mary and Joseph and the, the birth of Christ. Here, we're not actually look, even looking at the birth. We're looking at the conception of Christ. And I have to admit to you, every time I read this story, and I've heard this before, I've heard people actually, skeptics and critics, uh, kind of point out to this passage as, as if it is... Uh, well, reading it more with, with feeling than, than thinking. That is, when, even when I read this passage and I think of Mary and Joseph, I, have, I, I imagine Joseph being devastated. The news, the, the one to whom he is engaged to be Mary had, has, has become pregnant with a child. The, the conception of Christ by the Holy Spirit by Joseph's initial reaction seems as if it has disrupted the love between Mary and Joseph. And talk about being disoriented. Joseph must have been devastated when he discovered that Mary was expecting. And so the verses go this way, beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. I can assure you of this, that if you were engaged to be someone and you found out, if, if, if you were a man who found out that a woman had conceived a child, that you certainly would at least consider the prospect of calling off the marriage. But as Joseph considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Joseph, you have a part in this story, for he will save his people from their sins. Now let me ask you a couple questions. These are questions that have been asked. There's questions I've asked myself. Maybe you've never asked them, but let me go ahead and answer them anyway. First is, was their love disrupted? Mary and Joseph were betrothed. They were engaged to be married. Then the worst case scenario happens. Joseph discovers that Mary has been impregnated by someone else. 
That's disturbing, right? That's disturbing just in its own. Her body had become one with someone, not him. Their love had been, it seems, disrupted, interfered with. And then the angel tells him that it's not by some other man, but it's by God, by the Holy Spirit. And so that raises a second question. Again, skeptics through the ages have, have asserted this. Is this divine rape? I have to admit that many times I've read and, and I've felt the question, how can God do this to Mary? Or how can God do this to Mary and Joseph? who are engaged to be married. But this isn't divine rape. This isn't an account of God imposing his will upon Mary, prevailing upon her as, and victimizing her. This has been suggested by critics and skeptics or by those whose faith has been uncertain. In fact, that, that idea misses the miracle of the virgin birth, the conception and birth altogether. Simply put, this is not an adulterous relationship between Mary and God. There's no unfaithfulness between Mary and Joseph or between God and Joseph or between God and Mary. None at all. Yet Jesus' conception cannot be understood biologically. God begins with himself alone all the way back in creation. God is, just is. It's God. No creation. God just is. Father, Son, and Spirit. He begins with himself alone as creator, working this time in the conception of Christ, not out of nothing, but within our human existence. God has not joined himself to Mary, but to a human being who will merely carry another. So how is this not in divine rape, someone may accuse? And of course, again, the accusation has been but let me give you three reasons. Number one, Mary is a willing carrier. Go over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and let's begin in verse 26. We see the willingness, and this is going to play large in, in this story of love. Her willingness, her belief, her faith. In verse 26 of Luke chapter 1, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Notice here that Joseph is always included in all of the gospel accounts that we have of the conception of Jesus. J Joseph is always included, importantly included in this story. Who was of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now skip to verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. We find in this that Mary was not an unwilling carrier, but a willing carrier to what God had entrusted to her. But secondly, we find that Mary's contribution to this conception is merely passive. Now, this is important. As T.F. Torrance, British theologian, has put it, he says, quote, the virgin birth, and I would add the conception, is the doctrine. It's an important doctrine. We affirm it in our creeds. It's a cardinal doctrine to what we believe. In fact, uh, he would assert, and I would too, that we, we must affirm the virgin conception and birth as, as much as we affirm the resurrection of Christ. Because in both of those, we see the renewal of humanity, the beginning and the culmination. And so he says the virgin birth, the conception, is the doctrine that the movement of the Son of God to become man is one directional, from God to man. It cannot be reversed. In other words, Christ Jesus is not in any sense, even in a cooperative sense, the product of human activity. Now follow me here. We understand how children are normally conceived. In other words, the initiative, the sovereign act of God, it's entirely in God's hands. God acted alone in the conception of baby Jesus. Neither Joseph nor Mary asserted the self-will of the flesh in order to bring about this act of God. It's a miracle. 
Mary has nothing to do in this matter except what is done in her under the operation of the Spirit. What Mary, what Mary does is simply receive the word she believes. John of Damascus, 8th century church father, for instance, remarked that Mary conceived as he put it through the ear. In other words, she heard the word and she believed it. And in that moment of faith, God conceived all on his own, his son. She heard, she believed, Christ was, was conceived. This word, after all, is God's word, not Mary's, not Joseph's. Mary's participation was merely as a carrier, passive. It would be mistaken to imagine that Mary was active or that I would suggest that she even made a biological contribution to Christ's conception. The miracle is that God the Spirit alone conceived the incarnate Son of God, get this, within humanity. Within humanity. And then third... This is not divine rape because this demonstrates the oneness between God and man. Not only was Mary a willing carrier, not only did she not cause, even in part, even contribute anything necessarily biological to the conception of Christ, but finally the conception of Christ within Mary speaks of a higher, more heavenly reality. Namely, that the oneness between God and humanity is greater than the physical oneness between a man and a woman. We can, based on our understanding of God as, as big and mighty, as creator, we can imagine humanity being within God. Acts says that in Acts chapter 17. But this miracle is that somehow God in his power, the power of the Holy Spirit, is now contained within humanity. That's the miracle, and it's a miracle beyond our comprehension, yet necessary if mankind is to be renewed in the image of God. Now, you and I read Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1 every year, but have we ever really gotten our heads wrapped around the fact that, that God entered into this, into this world within another human being? Now, let's just very quickly remind ourselves of the progression of God's revelation. We go back to, to creation, when God created Adam out of dust. Remember, he formed the dust, and there is a, a lifeless form of Adam that God had gathered up, lifeless until God breathed his spirit, right, into that dust, and that dust becomes a living soul. You remember that? And then God forms Eve from the side of Adam, that tells us what God can do with dust. God can breathe into it and make it living. And then later, God instructs Moses in Exodus 28 to construct a tabernacle. And in Exodus 40, after that has all been constructed, God himself descends into that tabernacle. And his presence is there, his spiritual presence. They couldn't see him, but they could sure feel him. He was there, and he was dwelling among his people. It was certainly a miracle, something, something supernatural. But here it's even more intimate. Now God actually enters into a hu another human being. The most intimate form of oneness we can possibly imagine. Now this is not merely God impregnating Mary. This is Mary pregnant with God. You get that? True, there's no way that Mary can comprehend. There's no way a human body can carry God. And yet... God descended all the way, humbled himself all the way to the point of becoming something that could be carried by a human person. On this occasion, God took on human flesh just so he could become one with humankind. That is through the Virgin Mary. This is not divine rape. Once again, I ask myself, how is this not divine rape, divine adultery? Didn't God interfere with the oneness and the unity that Mary and Joseph should have had exclusively? And I say, no, he didn't. This is not divine rape. It's not adultery. It's not a breach of the oneness that Mary and Joseph should have had. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You see, in marriage, marriage itself is an analogy of the oneness that, we, that God calls us to with himself. There is, by the way, marriage in heaven. That's a sermon maybe I'll get to after the new year. There is marriage in heaven. There's one marriage in heaven. It is the bride and the bridegroom. Christ and his church, as Ephesians 5 tells us, and as Revelation 22 tells us. 
The analogy that we have, my own marriage, is merely an analogy of the oneness that God calls us to with himself. And Joseph understood this, which is why he didn't divorce Mary. Joseph understood that human marriage is not eternal. It's merely an, an analogy of how we will be one with Christ. We are the bride of Christ. The delight of a husband and his bride pales in comparison to the delight the church will have in Christ and Christ and his church. So let me conclude with these facts that we can draw from the virgin conception of Jesus. Number one, it was fitting for God to conceive within Mary, to conceive, I say, himself within Mary. Well, clearly, we know biologically, clearly Joseph wasn't fitting to bear a child. Mary, on the other hand, is like a second to Eve. Eve received the word of God and then disobeyed. Eve, or Mary, received the word of God and she believed. In the same way, all who have eternal life must believe. Not that we contribute to our salvation, but that we allow ourselves, we open ourselves to the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit within us. We receive that and we accept it in faith. God sovereignly works in every human being and it only remains for us to believe in him and thereby be saved. That's one. Number two. It is this oneness between the baby Jesus and the Virgin Mary that we come nearest in this age and in this flesh, understanding what it is that God has in store for us in heaven. Can you imagine this? If, if in this fallen age, all right, because remember, we, we're Protestants. We do not affirm, as the Roman Catholics do, we do not affirm that Mary herself was born sinless. The Roman Catholics affirm that Mary herself must have been born sinless in order to be able to carry the sinless child of God. We don't affirm that because Scripture teaches else, uh, something else, namely that, that all have sinned, that as Hebrews says, only Christ was without sin. And so, but we see in this the nearest example, the nearest we can come to the union of God and humanity. That Mary herself could somehow contain anything of God, even the incarnate form of God. Yet yeah, that says something about what our eternal relationship with God will be. Third, the closest we can come now physically to demonstrating our oneness with God is when we gather together at the Eucharist at the Holy Table of Communion. And we partake of those two symbols that God, that God himself gave to us through Christ. The bread and the wine, which Jesus says are symbols of his body and his blood. Now, Jesus could have, could have chosen many different symbols. He could have chosen anything. But he chose something intentionally that, get this, that we can consume. Bread and wine, something that we can digest, something that when we take it in, there's something of those elements that become part of us. The bread and the wine, our body takes that, takes the nutrition from it and uses it and stores it and makes something of it. He chose elements that we can consume in order to get this across this idea of the kind of love, the kind of oneness that God desires to have with us. It's best described in terms of consumption or absorption, in terms of pregnancy or containment. There's a commingling of persons in Mary's pregnancy. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, and Mary, a common woman. But fourth, Mary did not violate her covenant with God or with Joseph. God did not interfere with their wedding plans. Rather, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us so that he may send the spirit of his son into our hearts, as Galatians says. And so the passage, the passage of, uh, ends here. When Joseph woke from his sleep, in Matthew chapter 1, the end of that chapter, says, When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. 
He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And get this, and Joseph called his name Jesus. Joseph, not Mary, but Joseph called the baby Savior, Jesus. That's quite a different attitude that a man would have who found out that the woman to whom he is engaged is pregnant with another child, not his. Mary gave her body to carry Jesus. Joseph gave his name. That is, he owned in this moment. He owned that what God had done was not merely for Mary, but for him too. You see, God did not only choose Mary, though she was the carrier, but God chose Joseph. God put his son, a baby, under the power and the authority of a parent named Joseph, an ordinary man, yet a man with the power to do to this baby what Satan himself would desire to do. Yet Joseph took this young child and in faith loved him as his own, believing and knowing that Jesus was not conceived through any covenant unfaithfulness by Mary or by God, but in believing called his name Savior, Jesus. Now, when John said that God manifested his love among us and that he sent his only son in order that we might have life, we find that life is not conceived in us by God prevailing upon us, or in a sense, as we may put it, God raping or victimizing us, but according to our will, by the promise and the reception of faith. You see, again, Mary and Joseph, in loving one another and loving God, received the promised child, a child that had been promised since the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve had sinned and God had promised the child would be born. In this Advent season, we are called to a love that's demonstrated by God, manifested among us, and we receive that with the same reception, the same faith in which both Mary and Joseph responded to God, not in covenant unfaithfulness, but a willingness to God's announcement and a response of, God, you know best, you do your will in me. And when we have that attitude toward God, love will be born in every one of us. And so let love be born in you by faith this Advent. Would you stand with me? Our Father and our God, our Creator and our King, we bless your holy name for you have given to us your Spirit. And while we are not the carriers of the flesh and the blood of that second person of the Trinity, the Word of God incarnate, we are carriers of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that this day that your Spirit would be born in us afresh and anew. For it is your Spirit who forms us, who shapes us, who loves through us. And we pray that the love of God would be manifest among us in us, through us, this Advent season. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. We do hope that you'll join us either online or in person tonight. God bless you.